My name is Average Joe, and I'm a proud geek with expertise in movies, superheroes, and animation. My name is Beef Pork Ribs. I'm a fine repository of esoteric knowledge, which I suppose most people would qualify as geeky. Though I dabble in many fandoms, my main areas of expertise are anime, movies, and Belgian comics, with a strong recent insurgency of D&D. Our mission is to bring nerd and geek culture to the masses. By sticking it all under the microscope. Welcome, Welcome to, to the, the Bat Jar, Jar Podcast. Podcast. Movies, comics, graphic novels, TV, cartoons, animation, nerds, their geeks, entertainment, culture. Hear it on the Bat Jar, nerdy pal. Nerds and geeks, come gather around the scene. Come and join us in the Bat Jar. Come and tune in to Average Show and his team. Lots of here in the Bat Jar. When the newest nerdy news drops, these caught us pals, put it under the scope. DC, Marvel, Disney, Star Wars, cinematic, multiverse. Hello there, and welcome to the Bat Jar Podcast, where we put nerd and geek culture under the microscope. Unfortunately, this week, both Beef Pork Ribs and Ben the Movie Buff are going to not be on the episode. They're unavailable, doing other things that I'm sure are very nerdy and or geeky, which means it's going to be just me this week. No, I'm kidding. I'm actually here with uh, a new special guest, someone who has never been on the show before. And that means we have to kind of follow the protocol that we go through whenever we have a new guest on the show. So in our segment called New Guest, Who Dis? We introduce the new guest, or rather they introduce themselves. So let us welcome to the Batchar podcast, Shaggy Neo. It's good to be here. Thanks for having me, Average Joe. Well, you're off to a good start. You said my name properly. Some people skip the average part, and that it always bothers me because it's like, you know, I'm average Joe. I'm not Joe. There's a bazillion Joes out there, but there's only one average Joe. That's right, and you're, well, far above average in our hearts. So every time a new guest comes on the show, we ask them two questions. So I hope you're ready for this. I hope I am too. What kind of nerd or geek are you? Oh, man. So this was one... I, you know, we were talking before the show started, you were mentioning uh, having some segments that you, you redo now and then. Uh, I was wondering if we could redo the definition of nerd and geek, just for any uh, listeners who have, are tuning in you know, for the first time, and also for my sake, so that I answer this question properly. Why not? I'm, I'm feeling generous today within this new guest who dis segment. Early on in the podcast history, I want to say it was like episode like 47 or something, we actually did an episode, Nerd versus Geek, where we kind of broke down what the common uses of the words nerd and geek were, and what we found at the time is they're actually two different things, or at least the internet seems to believe that the words mean two different things. So a nerd is someone who enjoys more solitary interests, and they're more into perhaps Star Trek than Star Wars. They're more interested in science fiction and technology and philosophy and chess. And they're, they would typically follow into STEM career paths. Whereas a geek is typically someone who is almost evangelistic about their interests, whereas the, the nerd would pursue it individually and it's like something that they can enjoy for themselves. The geek wants to bring other people into their experience. So people who are really into board games, Dungeons and Dragons, movies, you name it. They're people who want to bring others into the experience of what they're experiencing. So, And they're, they're more interested in like the fantasy element of Star Wars than the philosophical science fiction underpinnings of Star Trek. Got it. Okay, so I think I can answer the question a lot uh, more correctly uh, within the context of how we understand ger- nerd and geek, <laughs> nerd and geek uh, oh. on the show. Um, for me, I would say uh, I'm a bit of both. I definitely have some nerd and some geek. The nerdy parts would be just the fact that I'm pretty much interested in almost anything. So I will just enjoy learning about something new, spending hours reading up online or going to check something out in real life that I've just never done before or don't really understand all that, that well and just diving into the details. So it could be anything from aviation to history to Anything you can find in a museum, any opportunity to see how something is made, um, 
I'll, I'll get right into that kind of stuff. Um, I never could pin down one discipline when I was in university. So I actually switched majors three times before I uh, graduated. So that maybe gives you a bit of an idea. Like I just love learning anything and everything. So that's, that's my nerd part. The geek part for me would be a few, uh, few common, I would say, fandoms for the most part. Uh, board games, I would say I'm a moderate level uh, geek when it comes to those. I'm always down to bust out a board game. Uh, love new, uh, playing a new game. I will also play, you know, 10 rounds in a row of games that are my, uh, my standbys, like uh, Dominion or uh, big on Settlers of Catan when that was first breaking into the board game scene. You know, what is that, 10, 15 years ago in North America? Um, and then Lord of the Rings would be another one. I, uh, I once won third place in a costume contest at a midnight showing for, uh, I believe it was the Fellowship of the Ring. I was dressed as Gandalf. And so that's one that I, I, I got really into, like talking about it, like getting into the, the, the nuances and the philosophy of it as well. But and I know a lot of people say they're Lord of the Rings geeks, um, but I think a lot of people say that just meaning that they're a casual fan, meaning they maybe read the book and they enjoyed the movies. I read the book nine times when I, from when I was 11 to when I was 19. And then uh, I've read uh, The Silmarillion multiple times and a bunch of the other sort of extended, I guess you could say extended universe elements of, uh, of Middle Earth. So I've gotten pretty geeky about that one. And, uh, and then today's topic, American Ninja Warrior, I would say that's probably the thing in the last four or five years I've been the geekiest about, where I'm getting as many people into it as I can. Uh, I love talking about the show. I love watching the show. I love introducing people to the show. I also love doing ninja uh, courses uh, as often as I, as I get a chance um, and finding ways to, to be like a ninja in everyday life. Case in point, what I mean by that, I'm standing on a balance, uh, a balance disc as we're talking, and I've got my grip strength trainers by my desk, so trying to trying to flex my my geek ninja cred here. Um, but yeah, I'm into it. I think that's probably the most comprehensive response we've ever had to that question. So that's going to be the risk during that's going to be the risk during this podcast. You're going to have to cut me down, cut me off, or edit me out, because I'll just ramble. Well, I, just, I think it speaks to your, your dual element of being nerdy and geeky, that you, you have clearly thought these things through. And that leads me into my next question. What kind of nerd or geek, or in your case, nerd and geek, do you want to be? So on the nerd side, I definitely <laughs> I want it to be a force for good. So a lot of the different things that I've learned over the years have be, ended up being helpful. Um, in some way. And so I could really enjoy uh, diving into whether it's technical or, you know, even uh, just mental, uh, mental training, like my background is kinesiology. And so being able to help people with what I've learned um, on the nerd side, on the geek side, I'd love to be the kind of geek that people enjoy uh, being around. Like I love the, the way you kind of describe the geek being an evangelist for what they're into. Um, there's nothing better than sharing something fun with fun people. So I guess I want to be the kind of geek that uh, brings other people into the geekdom and uh, they have a good time. Well, that's very, very great to hear. It sounds like you're, you're very uh, altruistic in your pursuits of being nerdy and geeky. So. <laughs> so hopefully everyone listening feels like they understand who Shaggy Neo is now. And that was a new guest, Who Dis. And this brings us right into talking about today's topic. We had a listener write in some time ago asking us to talk about American Ninja Warrior. So I've called upon Shaggy Neo because, as he just said, he is a geek about American Ninja Warrior. So we're going to start our conversation by doing our Secret Origins segment, SOS, talking about how we were first introduced to this franchise. I don't know if that's the right word to use. So I was introduced to American Ninja Warrior by uh, a roommate back around, I want to say it would probably have been around season seven of the show. 
which would have been just, no, no, nah, it must have been at least season seven. Um, the, my roommate showed me an episode from uh, USA versus Japan, um, or actually USA versus the world. So that was the second international competition for American Ninja Warrior. And uh, the, the climb off between Travis Rosen and I want to say it was Sean McCall representing uh, Europe. And so they, they climbed this rope that's, what is it, 70 feet, 40, 40 70 feet in the air, um, straight up, just hands and feet. And whoever gets to the top the fastest wins. And I just, the kinesiologist in me got really excited. That was just really fun uh, competition. The 28-year-old rock climber was the hero for Team Europe on stage four last season, but that came after his memorable run on stage three. Last year, Sean McCall put on one of the most dazzling stage three displays we've ever seen. Look at him, Matt. He's just moving around like it's nothing. He could finish this entire course in under three minutes. That is unheard of. Sean McCall. Um, started watching the rest of the show. Uh, within the next couple of years, I've watched every episode, including um, back when it was American Ninja Challenge, and uh, started looking for ways to, to see if I could get on the show. So far, no, uh, no Canadians are allowed to apply. So waiting for a Canadian version of the show to start or for them to open up the, the doors a little bit wider. I remember when I was in high school, there was a show on called Wipeout that I, I watched... And for those who aren't familiar, Wipeout is a show where people essentially try and run through challenging obstacle courses. And it's presented as like a comedy because the, the people doing the courses are somewhat silly and goofy. And, and it's, it's, like a, it's like America's Funniest Home Videos in that a lot of the entertainment value comes from the fact that the people are hurting themselves when they fail, on, they fall off the obstacles. And I remember watching that show, not regularly, but I'd, if it was on, I'd watch it because I thought it was funny. And I realized that it, that Wipeout has no official connection to American Ninja Warrior, but that was my first introduction to this idea of like a TV show where people are running through obstacle courses. But then I think the first time I actually heard about American Ninja Warrior itself was through Arrow, the TV show, because the lead actor from that show, Stephen Amell, he competed in apparently uh, what's called Celebrity Ninja Warrior, where they had essentially a bunch of celebrities come on to American Ninja Warrior, and it was like a fundraiser for charity. And I saw on YouTube, I think it was, Stephen Amell does Ninja Warrior Challenge, and I was like, what's this? And so I remember clicking on the video, and it was, I think it was like Entertainment Tonight or some news channel kind of cov like doing a story on the fact that Stephen Amell had done this warrior challenge and I thought it was funny in a way because part of the challenge was doing the salmon ladder and for those who don't know what the salmon ladder is it's you're basically like trying to do a pull-up except you're then jumping up and bringing the bar up to another rung of a ladder and why this was funny to me is because on the show Arrow you see Stephen Amell as his character using a salmon ladder all the time so the idea that, oh, of course he's going to do the salmon ladder. He, he does that on TV all the time. Uh, and so that was my first time being introduced to this whole concept of American Ninja Warrior. But now the flywheels, and this is a tough one. Got it! And like all these celebrities, he's only had a little training on these obstacles. This is just natural athletic ability. Look at that! This is real deal stuff out of the superhero. Woo! Well, fanboys all across America are losing their minds. They've been waiting to see this. And it was after that, discovering the show existed, and then being shown clips kind of here and there by friends such as yourself, and it was really only in the last week that I've actually sat down and watched whole episodes of the show. It's interesting that uh, I, I just love that tidbit that the Salmon Ladder made its way into another show completely out of context of American Ninja Warrior. So I'm pretty sure it only exists in the context of you know, Sasuke and American Ninja Warrior 
but it started to infiltrate different different places of geekdom, I guess you could say, like the Arrowverse. So there you go. There's our SOS, how we were both introduced to this franchise. Let's get into a bit of some of this history just really briefly here. So this is, in a sense, a spinoff of a Japanese show called Sasuke, as was just mentioned, which was created by a man named Ushio Higuchi, if I'm saying that correctly. The great thing about Japanese is that you pronounce it like it looks, and so you probably did pretty well. Arigato. And yeah, so Sasuke was this this show that existed in Japan sometime before American Ninja Warrior even existed. So Shaggy Neo, maybe if you could just briefly talk about like what Sasuke is. So Sasuke is kind of an interesting, it's definitely the, the most direct precursor to American Ninja Warrior as we'll get into it. But the, uh, the concept is almost like somebody saw Wipeout, but then wanted it to be more fair. <laughs> they still wanted to see people fall into the water and, you know, have epic fails and splashdowns, but actually not have it rigged to just knock them over, like give them a chance of succeeding. So uh, the Sasuke show has, uh, I think it's a, I think it's a hundred competitors who anybody can apply. Uh, your, your qualification is simply, do you place in the top 100 of, I think it's like a three kilometer run or a 1200 meter run, which isn't really like a skill that you need to run the course. But anyway, that's the, the way you qualify for that show. And then you run four different obstacle courses. And if you complete all four, then um, you, you achieve total victory, or as they say in Japanese, kanzen zeha. And, uh, and that's the overall idea. The, the, the courses get progressively harder. The first course, I think they typically get maybe about half the competitors completing. By the end, there's usually one or two or none uh, make it to the final, uh, the fourth stage, depending on the season. So I'm guessing that you were not familiar with Sasuke before American Ninja Warrior. No, that uh, I, I came, I went backwards when I went back from the uh, season seven of American Ninja Warrior. I started going back in history, and then through American Ninja Challenge, realized that it came from this show called Sasuke. And I've I've watched a little bit of that. I won't say that I've uh, versed myself as much in the history. I'm familiar with some of the big names, uh, like Makoto Nagano and Yuji Yurushihara, and you know these uh, stalwarts, these impressive um, champions that have come out of there. But um, yeah, I'm not an expert on Sasuke per se. So I find this interesting because American Ninja Warrior kind of joins the club of things like Power Rangers, which is based on a Japanese property, but it was sort of given an American coat of paint. And unless you knew that it was based on something from Japan, you, you wouldn't, you wouldn't assume it was, was there anything about American Ninja Warrior when you first saw it that made you think this is definitely something from Japan? Probably only the fact that the final stage is called Mount Midoriyama, which sounds very Japanese. That was probably the first indicator that there was more history there. The other thing that I find really interesting, actually, is that when it got brought into the American scene, they almost ruined the show, in my opinion, uh, in the early seasons by trying to over-Americanize it. Um, the initial attempt, American Ninja Challenge, looked a little bit more like American Gladiator or Tough Mudder, like very intense, rugged, just beat you down and build you back up kind of Marine Corps vibe that doesn't really work with the original show, the way the Japanese portray it, where it's kind of, it is a really a mashup between a wipeout silliness and, uh, and a serious obstacle course. So they thankfully kind of went back to the roots of the Japanese show, I would say, and uh, injected a little bit more levity, uh, realized that it's the human stories of the people running the course and, uh, and overcoming obstacles, that makes for interesting television and not just the intensity of it all. So according to what I'm looking at here, the way that American Ninja Warrior came to be is that this channel G4, which I've never heard of before, it's, I guess it's an American cable channel, but they were actually uh, airing episodes of Sasuke with subtitles. And I guess because people liked that, they did the American Ninja Challenge, which you just spoke about. And after two years of that, that got them the idea of actually making American Ninja Warrior its own show. So the 
this the, the series we're talking about today is in fact like the sequel to a spinoff <laughs> in a way. Yeah, exactly. I think that's a good way to put it. From the land of the rising sun, 100 determined athletes have accepted the challenge to become Ninja Warrior. Divided into four extreme stages, competitors face the ultimate test of strength and will in their quest to become champion. Many are called, few are chosen. Now, let's find out who's tough enough to become the next Ninja Warrior. And what we're going to do with this episode, we're actually going to, we're introducing a new type of Bat Jar podcast episode with this topic because I was having a conversation with my brother, Dan Hatton, yesterday, of telling him we were going to be doing this very episode. And he was kind of surprised to hear that American Ninja Warrior was going to be our topic because for him, he didn't quite understand how this fit into the broad scope of what we consider to be nerd and geek culture. Because, yeah, generally when we're talking about nerdy geek culture, it's things that are superheroes or science fiction or fantasy and then stuff like Gilmore Girls and Outlander and the musical Hamilton kind of sneak in there. And so you actually, Shaggy Neo, had this great idea to come up with a new kind of, it's almost like an audition for a topic to see if it, if it is uh, indeed worthy of being considered part of nerdy geek culture. So we're going to be calling this Everybody Wants to Be in the Bat Jar, which is certainly what we want for our audience, but all the topics naturally want to be nerdy and geeky because that's just what they are. So, Yeah, and this, this, this idea came to me partly because uh, it reflects how I feel. I want to be in the Bat Jar. I want to be a nerd and geek. I've been watching, listening to the podcast for a long time and was asking myself, like, where do I fit in this show? Like, I want to be in this show. It's really fun. I love the concept. I love the, the conversation. Um, but maybe I, 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 there's a certain part of me that feels like I need to justify being here. So by justifying the topic, maybe I can be validated too. <laughs> so in this first installment of Who Wants to... Or... And so in this first installment of Everybody Wants to Be in the Bat Jar, we're going to be talking about whether American Ninja Warrior is indeed something that can be talked about in the scope of nerd and geek culture. And right I think on. a good way to, yeah, I think a good way to just get started talking about this is to talk about the show itself. And my sense is that as we get into, I mean, we're already talking about it being a spinoff of something from Japan. So in my mind, like we're already down the track of considering it part of nerd and geek culture, but that's not... <laughs> jumped any conclusions uh the show is called american ninja warrior so i guess the fact that ninja is in the title kind of gave us a hint that it was related to something from japan that's true i assume because i have very limited exposure to the franchise as i'm going to call it that the whole point of the show is that it's a test to see if you can become an american ninja warrior yeah, there's sort of layers of uh, meaning, even just like, I think strictly speaking, you know, if uh, the show was to declare who is, who are American Ninja Warriors, they'd say the people who finished all four stages of the Vegas finals um, or, or Kanzan Zeha. But more kind of colloquially, just getting on the show kind of makes you an American Ninja Warrior at some level. Completing any of the courses along the way uh, is like another level. But yeah, definitely the the total victory, uh, completing all four finals courses would be the the ultimate declaration of being an American Ninja Warrior. So I'm going to try and explain what I understand the process to be, and I'm going to rely on you to kind of correct me if I'm wrong. So there's multiple American cities where they go and they set up one of these ninja courses, and they have a qualifying round for each city where participants go through the run and if they fit in if they either complete the course or they fit into the top number of people for how far you get through the course you then move on to the finals for that city mm -hmm. am i right so far doing great so far okay and then 
for each city they have a ninja course for it, they do a finals. So it's like one episode where it's the finals for Minneapolis or whatever city you're in. And it's the same process. Everyone goes through the course again, except there's kind of like a second backstage course that they go through if they finish the first half. And again, whoever either completes the course or finishes in the top ranking of individuals moves on to the, uh, is it the Vegas finals, like the national finals? That's right, yeah. And they, they kind of use the names interchangeably. You could either say the Vegas finals, but really they're the national finals. They just happen to take place in Vegas. Now, I read somewhere that when the show started, like when ANW specifically started, the the prize for winning was actually just being qualifying to compete on Sasuke. That's right. Yeah, when it was American Ninja Challenge, the the qualifying course was actually only there was only one qualifying course. It was in Venice Beach, California, and uh, I think it was the first year. Yeah, so the first year it was just submission videos. The second year. Uh, which were voted on by the fans. And then the second year, they had the Venice Beach course, which if you completed it, you then went to a boot camp to whittle down the top 10 finishers of the Venice Beach course. And that was where I think it almost lost its way because it was more like a Marine Corps military-style training base in the middle of the desert, uh, which is not like the lighthearted and fun uh, show that people are are more used to now. Uh, And then, yeah, if the the top two or three would go to Japan to compete. So winning the show was basically getting your ticket paid for to Japan and getting on the show there. Now, if I, like, if I really wanted to compete on Sasuke is, is, are there rules set up so that the only way like an American could participate is if they won this qualifying challenge in the States? No, actually there's a, there was one uh, competitor that comes to mind in particular, Kane Kusugi. Uh, who, as you can tell, has some Japanese heritage, but he's actually an American. Uh, he was on the show before American Ninja Challenge ever came to be. A few other Americans, I think, had competed before as well. Uh, and Americans have continued to go over and compete. Uh, and actually, I'm not sure if there's been any Canadians, but they, they do take international competitors uh, through their normal intake over in Japan. So maybe that's something I should do, is try to get on Sasuke. Once we can all fly again, once it's... Uh, this we're all out of lockdown now do you think it was a good idea for a and w to kind of introduce their own final prize as opposed to like to divorce themselves from sasuke it's an interesting question um a little bit of column a a little bit of column b like after going back and watching the old uh seasons and just the way that it, the first uh, season, I think it was season four, uh, being on American soil with the finals in, in the States, it felt like they did lose a little bit of the history and the, the mystique around the Mount Midoriyama. And it sort of became a little bit glitzy. Uh, and I felt like there was something kind of lost and moving away from, from the Japanese finals. Um, that being said, though, the, the show has taken on a life of its own that is really, I think, is really enjoyable now. And it gives uh, more ninjas an opportunity to, to t- test themselves against the, the finals courses and that, uh, that higher level of competition, which is great for the viewer and I think great for the ninjas. Like, it's not everybody that can afford to take the time and, and, uh, and energy out of their, their lives to travel across the world to, to compete like that. So having it right within America makes it more doable for people. So only people who accomplish total victory kind of get that status of American Ninja Warrior. But it seems as though from what I've seen, they kind of refer to anyone who participates as a ninja. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody who enjoys sort of the the mental and physical challenge, the camaraderie of, of overcoming obstacles together like in some sense is a ninja like there's a it's a really broad uh community i would say that uh, that welcomes people in at all fitness levels um that's one of the reasons why i'm a geek about it and try to bring other people into it is pretty much anyone of any fitness level um can 
accomplish, can overcome some of these obstacles, uh, given you know even uh, even a little bit of practice. So it's it's fun for everybody, and yeah, you can get that title of you know I'm a ninja, even if you're just starting out. When I started watching the show this week, I immediately thought of zombie shows. And the reason why I say this is because part of the appeal of shows like The Walking Dead is you're imagining yourself in that situation and you're asking yourself those questions. What would I do if I was in this circumstance? Would I behave differently than the characters are or would I do the same things that they're doing? And so it's a great way to kind of insert yourself into the scenario. And when I was watching the show, that's how I felt. As I'm seeing the different ninjas attempt these obstacles, I was thinking to myself, okay, if I was there, if I was competing and doing this, how would I try and address these challenges? And let's be frank, I'm not in good shape. I don't even think I can do, maybe I can do maybe one pull-up, and that's about it. So I do not have the, the strength or the technique to you know, do one of these ninja courses properly. I'd probably like fail right away, but just imagining it's like, okay, if I were in a better shape or if I was actually there, if I were to just be thrown onto one of these courses right now, how would I fare? Like how far could I go? Yeah. Yeah. I was wondering where you were going to go. I was looking in the show notes before we started and you had that connection to zombie shows in here. And I was like, what's the connection to zombie shows? Like I have no idea, but you're absolutely right. Like that's a great point. It, you do project yourself into what the competitors are doing. I always catch myself like, I can't watch the show and sit, sit still. You know, you're, you're constantly kind of like, oh, swing a little further, you know? And um, I can totally, can totally relate. On a, on a nerdy note, um, with my background in, in kinesiology, just uh, watching the show and picturing yourself doing it, you're probably getting better at doing it uh, than you were before you watched the show. So maybe uh, if you watch it enough, <laughs> you could actually, you, you know, you do actually get better. Um, I'd watched a ton uh, of the show before I actually tried a course, and I really surprised myself because I was able to do a lot of it, and I think it had to do with watching people do it well. So the one episode, well, I've, I've watched about two episodes now, but the, the commentators on the show, they kind of reference the difference between pure athleticism and technique because you could be a bodybuilder and be able to lift a lot of weight or you could be a free runner or like one of those parkour people who is really gifted athletically but it seems to me that to succeed on one of these ninja courses you need a good combination of both absolutely and i would add maybe a third element there and it's just overcoming the obstacle that is your own mind. You see uh, a lot of competitors who have the technique and the athleticism, but they're trying to go too fast or um, they're just the nerves get to them. And then, you know, something that they should be able to do, they, they just fail on. So definitely technique comes in big. There's been a lot of very gifted athletes on the show, uh, notably, Olympians actually tend to do poorly. Uh, there's only a handful of Olympians who've actually finished even a qualifying course. Most of them fail pretty early, which is, is interesting because they're Olympians. They're about as fit and athletic as you can get. But something about the technique or the mental game gets them. And so you need, you need all three. And again, that, that's a sort of, uh, I guess, brings more of the... Uh, kind of it, the entertainment value it admittedly partly comes from just how, how incredible it is that people can actually do these things because like i said i am nowhere near being in, in enough shape to do these like i know you 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 could probably do one of these things because you're in good shape and you you have the technique down but it's incredible honestly like it's like to wow look at that look what they're doing this is crazy yeah it is really wild to watch um and it's really fun to do. This is the other reason why I feel like it fits um, in kind of the nerd and geek realm is uh, all of us growing up, like our, what's the big draw to superheroes or one of the draws is just their ability to do these amazing things that like, you know, you're swinging from rooftops or you're, you're lifting, you're jumping, jumping over buildings in a single bound and all this. 
And um, American Ninja Warrior and that whole culture, it's almost like the, it gives you an opportunity to live that. You get to, to be a kid again and say, I want to be able to, to swing like Spider-Man or jump, you know, like Superman. Now, from what I can read, looking into the show's history, they've changed. They changed networks a couple times, and usually, when a show changes networks, fans can kind of spot differences in either certain actors or uh, parts of the show have left because it's filming in a new location, perhaps, or because some of the behind-the-scenes production team is different. There's other changes to the show, and it, I know you said you kind of like started watching the show later in its run, but could you tell? differences from the the times that changed networks oh yeah definitely like uh and some of the changes i think uh like it's it's probably i don't know if this is rare but it's been on three different networks g4 usa and nbc if i'm not mistaken i think it's just the three of them and um landing on nbc is when they finally got the recipe right i would say so it got better as it went along um, some shows sometimes get kind of start up top and then get shunted down and they kind of lose quality over time. This is, I think has gained quality over time. When it was on G4, it was really adversarial. It was like the ninjas were competing against each other to get a chance to go to Japan. Um, and, uh, so that's again, sort of that, that tone of that, that didn't really quite work. Um, it was still really fun, like the obstacles and the wipeouts and, and things like that were still really fun. But the overall tone of the show was, I'm going to beat you. When it uh, evolved um, to, towards the USA network, which was very brief because NBC realized what a, what a winner they had and kind of snapped it up pretty quickly at that point, it was starting to, be, uh, to get to that culture of it's actually the ninjas versus the course. And so there's a, there's a culture of them encouraging each other, uh, which I think was a, a real positive spin. Makes sense for NBC being a more family-oriented uh, network. And, uh, and they're the hosts of the show, whereas another big change. Um, originally, yeah, the, the hosts were sort of getting in their face and trying to stir up controversy between the athletes themselves, uh, which wasn't quite a fit. There was an emphasis on serious athletic analysis. There was like they had some Olympians uh, as part of the, the sideline uh, reporters and analysts, and that didn't quite work either. With, uh, with NBC, they really doubled down on having hosts that were really just fans of the show and fans of the athletes. So they got the comedian, Matt Eisman, who brings a lot of energy and enthusiasm to the show. They got Akbar Bajamiya Milla, which um, he's an ex NFL uh, defensive end, but so he's got the athleticism and he can kind of comment on that. But he's also just over the top enthusiastic and really enjoys watching people succeed, uh, and he's really cheering them on. So those are probably some of the big changes, and then just the production value. Um, NBC has a way bigger budget, and so you can see the the production value both in filming in course quality they brought in some uh, much better course builders the first uh, version on the attack of the show on g4 american ninja challenge was just like a sub sub thing on a, on a g4 show called attack of the show they literally just went to the local gymnastics facility and set up a course for these guys to qualify on with standard gymnastics equipment um, so it, it's definitely come a long way, and you can see it uh, in a lot of different areas, but um, those are, I, I'd say, the big ones. So uh, the episodes I watched, I think, were from season eight, or from 2018, whenever, whatever season that would have been. And they're definitely from the NBC era, because they have the uh, host that you mentioned, and like the production quality, and like there's smoke that comes out when someone hits the button, and... It, it, there's a lot of lights and it, yeah, it's, it's definitely, it was like professionally and yeah, you could tell it was, and, and another thing I found funny is that like, you know, originally the show got you onto Sasuke, which at that time the prize was like 2 million yen, which translates to like maybe like $50,000. <laughs> and then once A and W started doing their own show, the prize for actually becoming the A and W person was 
a million dollars. So it's like, that's a huge gap and a huge difference in the amount of money you could potentially win. Yeah. Yeah. It definitely raised the, the stakes and made it uh, kind of a, a life changing moment for those folks who, who do manage to achieve uh, the title of uh, American Ninja Warrior. Now, I'm not sure if this is a product of it being on NBC, but I did kind of feel like I was watching American Idol or even like shows like Chopped, like the cooking show I enjoy watching. They always like have a backstory for all of the all the competitors and you find out like why they're there and like what what hardships they've gone through to get there. And I noticed that for like a lot of the contestants that they were highlighting on in, in American Ninja Warrior that they would like have spent time like filming them in their day-to-day life and like kind of explain like their story about how they got to competing on the show. So I was like, okay, this is much like other competition shows that you would watch on TV just for different kind of subjects is that you still, I guess, need to have that human component where you're like, you're connecting with the individuals beyond they're just, Oh, it's just some person doing a obstacle course. Yeah, absolutely. The neat thing about that is it's almost getting back to the Sasuke roots a bit. The, um, they do that a lot. Like the Makoto Nagano, I believe was, uh, Oh, I'm going to get this wrong. So the the real ninja geeks out there can uh, can write in and, and tell me to never be on the show. But uh, it was, um, he was like a, a fisherman. Um, another one of the champions was a plumber. Uh, and it's, it's those backstories that I think make it interesting that a, a normal everyday person can do something extraordinary is a great, you know, it's a great uh, trope, I guess you could say. It's a great story that we all get behind. It's like a, it sort of has an underdog flavor to it uh, from, from right from the beginning. And so when the American Ninja Warrior show kind of got back to that, telling the people's story, how they got to be here, um, the unique parts of, of their obstacles they've overcome in their life got a lot more interesting. And you might be offended by this, but I, I definitely uh, felt, comparisons to professional wrestling when i was watching this show partially because as you alluded to the commentators were very enthusiastic and over the top in their reactions to everything and a lot of the performers like they they either like would interact with the people watching on the sidelines as they were going through the course it's like yeah let's pump me up uh or they had like some kind of persona, like they had some kind of gimmick attached to themselves. So like, you know, the episode I just watched, there's a guy who eats bugs and he, that was like his, he had like a, he had like a bug on his shirt. Like everyone was seen to be, you know, in a way marketing themselves under some kind of brand, which again, made me think of wrestling because, or even superheroes or whatever. But this idea, it's like, oh, like it's the so-and-so or it's the, like, I think the one guy I remember watching you know, they were talking about how he had long hair and he was really emphasizing the fact, yeah, I've got long hair and that's kind of like my thing. <laughs> yeah, that's right. He's got a whip and I remember the guy, I can't remember the name of the ninja right now, but I, you know what, I can't really argue with you there. The similarities uh, go beyond just what you can kind of see. One of the most iconic female ninjas actually just became, like she retired from American Ninja Warrior competition to become a pro wrestler. So can't really argue with uh, with the connection you made there. Uh, Casey Catanzaro is now in the WWE, and she was the first woman to get up the warped wall in American Ninja Warrior competition. It's definitely there. I think the uh, the theatrical elements partly were were people's attempts in the early days to just stand out. You know, like if you're going to get a chance to be on a reality television show, you need to be unique. Um, I'd say it, that that aspect has diminished somewhat uh, in later seasons. Initially, it was like everybody had a name, everybody had an outfit. Um, you had one competitor who would breathe fire uh, to start every time he started the course, and then typically every season he'd also run the course in a T Rex uh, outfit. Um, I think that actually might have been how the T Rex. Like it's almost become a phenomenon of these people in T-Rex outfits showing up at random places. I think he might have been the, one of the first people to get that popular, his video of, of him running the course in a T-Rex outfit. But yeah, there's, I can't deny that comparison at all. Like there's uh, the drama to it is, is there. 
And to, from my understanding, one of the female competitors in this show is the stunt double on Supergirl. She is, Jessie Graff. And definitely, if not the strongest, definitely, definitely right up there, guy or girl. Um, she is phenomenally strong, phenomenally fit, phenomenally fast. Uh, I remember one season, the LA City Finals, uh, I don't think she finished the course, but she was one of only two people to get to the last, the final obstacle. And then there was only one person to actually finish the course. So she, she is really, really strong. So according to what I'm looking at here, only three people have actually achieved the title of American Ninja Warrior. That's right. Yeah. The, the first two did it on the same season. Uh, and there was a big controversy about that because uh, I think the, the show officially recognizes, uh, I think they've decided to officially recognize both of them as American Ninja Warriors, uh, but only one of them is called American Ninja Warrior Champion um, because he did it, he completed all four stages three seconds faster than, uh, so that was Isaac Caldero, the first American Ninja Warrior Champion. But Jeff Britton was the first person to actually complete all four st all four stages. So in in the ninja community, he's typically uh, kind of given credit for being the first American Ninja Warrior. But the show, because you know they had to pick a winner, they'll they'll talk about Isaac Caldiero first. And then some guy named Drew Dreschel is the only, the only other one to do it. And that was this past season. So. We're on season 12 this year, so since season four, which is when it first started being done in America, they didn't have a winner until season seven. So there was three uh, or four, was it four, five, six, seven, yeah, it was four seasons, uh, four seasons to crown a champion, and they had two, two completed that year. There was another uh, four seasons before they had another winner. So it is, it's a tough, tough obstacle course. And they've made it, they make, every time somebody completes it, they make it harder for the next year. So it, uh, the odds are stacked against people finishing it back to back years. And this actually admittedly makes me more interested in the show. The fact that they aren't crowning a new champion every single year, like American Idol. I kind of lost interest in that show. Cause I'm like, well, at this point, so many people have become the American Idol. What does it matter if you're just the 11th American Idol? But he, hearing that here, actually, you know what? It's only there. It's actually very challenging and very difficult, and only happened a handful of times that someone actually like achieves the the final goal here. Yeah, like right now, I think the UK has been running their version of the show for at least five years, maybe longer. They still haven't crowned a champion. Nobody's finished the course yet. Um, there's shows, spin-off shows in Spain, uh, in Malaysia, in a bunch of different countries, and most of them don't have uh, a, a champion yet, like a, somebody who's can achieve total victory. Uh, Japan has a number of them, they, but they've also been, they're up to season 35 or so now, so they should have a handful of winners by now, otherwise it's, uh, they've made it too challenging. It was actually interesting because the one episode I watched in its entirety, Isaac Caldiero was like, it was like his second time competing. Like he was trying to do the whole thing again. And it was like the city finals. So he'd already gone and qualified in one episode. And then this was like the city finals. And he actually like didn't finish the course. Yeah. Yeah. And that it was a balance obstacle that took him out, if I, if I recall correctly, which is every, every ninja will tell you the balance obstacles are the great equalizer. Anybody can can slip up on a balance obstacle, even the best. And case in point, Isaac Caldero uh, failed on a balance obstacle. Um, another classic example of that would be Jeff Britton, the other guy who's actually finished all four stages. The following season, he failed on the first obstacle of the national finals, which was a balance obstacle. Of course, Isaac was also running the course in jeans, which maybe was just a bad choice. <laughs> Yeah, it was weird. He was wearing like a golf shirt and like what looked like khakis. Yeah, yeah. Maybe he was taking it a little too casual, or maybe he was trying to make sure he didn't put too much pressure on himself. I'm not sure what. Right. So 
from what I understand, they kind of like they don't. It's the it's not a static thing. Like the obstacles kind of change over time. So I gotta. I, I'm sure you since you're a fan, you probably have like several or maybe a, one favorite obstacle that you like seeing people go through. Uh, yeah. I mean, I just want to try them all. So let's just put that out there. Um, some of my favorites would be uh, the Big Dipper, which is. You, have, you grab a bar that's uh, kind of on a track on either side and you slide down the track and it's like a, it curves down and then up. And so you have to launch yourself off the end and grab like a rope or a cargo net on the other side. So you're really flying through the air a bit like Spider-Man. That one um, would be up there. The Salmon Ladder is the iconic one that I think I like the most because it looks, it's, it is incredibly challenging, but the it is so technical that it actually, you don't need to be crazy strong to be able to do it. You just need to have good technique. So it makes it, I don't know, for me, it, it just feels like, oh, I could almost do that. You know, like, uh, I'm not quite that strong, but I think if I get the technique down, maybe I could pull it off. That's the, that, that's part of the whole mystique of it or the attraction to it. It's just, there's always an obstacle that's just out of reach that if I, I know if I put in the work, I could get that one down. And then after that, there's another one that's going to be just out of reach. And so I just got to, you know, you can always keep progressing. But yeah, those are the, two, those will be my two. Those will be my picks. The, the Big Dipper and the Salmon Ladder. The episodes I saw, the ones that kind of shocked me the most were the Spider Wall. Because you have to imagine, like, basically, the, the, the goal of the Spider Wall is you have to climb at least in this version anyway, maybe there's different versions, but this one, it was like you had to climb 35 feet up by essentially pushing your hands and legs up against a walls on either side. And it's far enough apart that you can kind of like scooch your way up by pushing your hands and feet up against the walls on either side. And you had to climb 35 feet and you had to like, they had like these glass doors that weighed a hundred pounds that you had to like push up so you could get, keep on going through on your way to the top. Yeah, that is definitely a great example of an obstacle that's changed over the years. The, the spider climb has been a part of Sasuke and American Ninja Warrior for a long time. That year, I think was the tallest version of a spider climb. And then they added those glass, those glass doors that you had to push up through. Uh, just to make it that much harder. And then they introduced this one in that episode called Kane Lane. And I, I couldn't, I was like, this is like, it seemed impossible because you're holding on to like a cane, basically like a, a, a maybe like a little larger version of like a cane an old person would use. And the idea is that there's this kind of like a pipe going across the pool. So it's a distance of like, I don't know, like 20 feet maybe. And the idea is you have to, like, by only holding on to this cane, like, you have to use the hook part of the cane to move yourself across <laughs> across this pipe. And there were parts of it where you had to, like, take the cane off the pipe to get around an obstacle and then hook it back on. Yeah, while you're suspended above the water. It's that – those are insane. <laughs> I, think the, I think there were only, like, four people who actually, like, completed that obstacle the whole time. Yeah, it's an interesting, a lot of the obstacles require both strength and speed. And that's a good, a good example of one where the longer you're on the obstacle, the harder it gets. So the people who complete it probably did it pretty fast. But the, then the challenge there is that it, the faster you go, the more likely you are to make a mistake. So you're competing against yourself again, just to make sure you don't go too fast and make a mistake, but fast enough that you don't get too tired to finish it and i'm sure you know we've talked about how like the competitors in this show are essentially personalities like we know stuff about them they interact with the audience and with with the public in different ways so do you have like favorite competitors or favorite ninjas well right now i am wearing some fan gear uh for the papal ninja sean bryan um, it's kind of uh, a funny story with that. Actually, I was, as I was getting into the show, I was like, man, yeah, one day I'm going to be on this show. Um, everybody seems to have like a ninja name. So I need to come up with a ninja name. And I was like, well, 
I'm personally Catholic, like I, uh, and I have like a, I'm a really enthusiastic about my faith. This might help me stand out. Like it might be my thing that differentiates me from all the other people applying. And so I was like, yeah, I'll be the papal ninja. And I looked, I looked it up just to see if there one, there was one that already existed. And sure enough, there's Sean Bryan. He's already uh, got a, a corner on that name. And uh, the next season, I, I reached out to him and gave him a little bit of a, a razz. I was like, hey, man, you stole, stole the name I was going to use. Uh, and then that season, he actually finished third on the show. So, um, yeah, he's my, he's my favorite ninja as of right now. And he's pretty well poised to, to maybe be the next American Ninja Warrior. He's a really good competitor. Yeah, and I've only watched two episodes, so I really don't have much of an exposure. But there was one competitor, he called himself the Deaf Ninja. Oh, he's great, yeah. Because this this young man whose name I can't remember is actually deaf and like in his day job he like runs ninja gyms for for children who are deaf. And I thought it was just cool that that I mean, of all the I guess physical disabilities that a person could have, being deaf would be the one that would make doing this course or this kind of athletic activity the easiest because you don't need to hear anything. All the challenges are visual. And he just seemed like a really, really uh, inspiring young man. So to the yeah. deaf ninja. Kyle Schultz, good man. Now, the thing that I was most surprised, and this is how I think we can kind of say it is part of nerd and geek culture, because I don't know if it's because of this show or if they were happening independently of each other, but there's this real world phenomenon of ninja gyms that exist now. Is this, this is correct, right? Yeah, that was uh, something that started actually with some of the original competitors on the show. David Campbell was one of the early competitors. He's actually one of only four guys who's competed on every season going back to the American Ninja Challenge. He built an obstacle course in his back. They call it his backyard. He actually has a pretty big property, so it's a big, a big course. Um, so it started off just with people building them, you know, in their backyards and things. Uh, and then as it caught on, there's uh, there's a number of boutique gyms. They're uh, they're often they kind of have started to to gain popularity around the same as the obstacle course racing gyms. You know, the mud runs. Um, and just boutique gyms in general. People don't just want to go and, and lift heavy things and put them back down. They want to have fun while they're getting fit. And so there's, uh, there's an obstacle course gym uh, here in Ottawa. There's uh, where, where I first checked it out was actually in Calgary, in Alberta. And um, there's a growing movement of them uh, across the country. I'm hoping that that means that we'll get our own version of the show soon. There's, I didn't even know there was one here. Uh, maybe I, uh, like what kind of, yeah, I, I'm like, would, could someone just walk in there and do these things or would you need to do like some pre-training first? So I actually, I kind of maybe simplified it by saying there's only one. There's actually three that I'm aware of. Uh, one that is an obstacle course racing gym. It has a variety of, of obstacles, including some classic ones from American Ninja Warrior. Then there's a climbing gym out in uh, Kanata that has uh, a Ninja Warrior course along the side. And then there's a gymnastics uh, facility here in the East End that, um, that also has one. Uh, so for the one at the obstacle course racing gym, that one's pretty intense, but there'd be some things that are doable for anybody walking in off the street. I'd be pretty confident about that. For the one out in Canada, they've actually got a great, a really well balanced. It's a small course, but definitely anybody walking in is going to have some fun, uh, be able to do you know a good chunk of it, but then have something that they just can't. Like you, there's going to be some things you just can't quite pull off. Um, so no matter how fit you are, you're going to go there and you're going to get a, a, a fun challenge out of it too. So for those who don't live in the city of Ottawa, he was basically just referring to different parts of the city. So. This this is intriguing. Like I think it says something that like a, this idea of the show, which again spun off of something from Japan, has now created the the real real world phenomenon of creating environments where people can try and replicate this. I guess for the hope of either just seeing this as like a fun way to exercise and to to get physically fit, 
or to with the hope, as you're alluding to, of this show actually coming to Canada at some point. Yeah, and actually, thanks for reminding me. There's another way that this, I think, really fits into nerd and geek culture is uh, I see there's a similarity in a way between an obstacle course uh, with the way that Ninja Warrior approaches it and Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, with D&D, you get a group of people together who try to come and basically, you know, they problem solve, they troubleshoot, they use their abilities to get through the dungeon uh, that the dungeon master has put together for them. The Ninja Warrior course is very similar. People get together, they try to pool their, their physicality and their techniques and like help each other out to overcome the obstacles of the course. Well, I think more or less I'm convinced at this point. Like it, it's and, and even when I'm watching this show, I think like, oh, like Spider Man would have such would this would be so easy for him. <laughs> he wouldn't break a sweat. It's like you know, would Batman like have the physicality to actually complete one of these things? Because they often say in the comics he's like an Olympic level athlete. But as you said, there are Olympians who uh, can't hack it and can't complete this course. So. I could certainly, I, I would love, I, I, yeah, I see so many ways that this is certainly falling into the umbrella. So, and, and this is my, my biggest selling point is actually like only after watching two episodes, I'm like, I could totally like I'm very much interested in getting into the show now. I, I see the appeal and I'm like, I'm this close to like committing to it. And so if there's anyone who's listened to this and maybe has had a similar revelation, Shaggy Neo, tell us, like, where should we get started? Oh, man. Where should you get started? Oh, that's a loaded question. Um, I wish I could say the next season is starting shortly, but it is filming is delayed, so we won't be getting the next season. Uh, normally, it would be starting in June, so we've got to wait a little bit. Um, just go on YouTube. And, and look up American Ninja Warrior Epic Run. Um, if, uh, if you have uh, NBC in your area, you can, and you're subscribed to, uh, to their, uh, their services, you can watch old, old seasons on NBC.com. Uh, if you're American and you're so lucky, you can watch them for free. Um, that's a great, great place to start. Check out some of the, I think, some of the more inspiring ones, like Kyle Schultze is a great one to, to watch. Um, if you want to see some top competitors, you can look up Jesse Graff, Casey Catanzaro, Jeff Britton, uh, the Papal Ninja, Sean Bryan, uh, Drew Dreschel, obviously, being the, the latest champion of the show. Um, Joe Morofsky is another great one. He's known as the Weatherman. Uh, and he's a, he's a pretty fierce competitor. He's been the last, last ninja standing a few seasons. Um, and you can always go to, there's the fan page. I mean, if you want to really geek out on it, you can go to American Ninja Warrior Nation.com or anwfantasy.com. If you want to get into the stats, uh, of the different ninjas and the chat, uh, they've gotten into all kinds of ratings as to how challenging the courses are. You can really lose yourself in it, but I would I would start with, with just watching some runs on YouTube. So to clarify, it's not available on any of the uh, known streaming services. Unfortunately, they are not uh, available on your typical streaming sites that I'm aware of. Of course, you can always watch Ultimate Beastmaster on Netflix, which is close. They're, they've undergone a similar evolution. They they came across the first season too heavy-handed. Uh, a little too much intensity. Subsequent seasons, they've gotten into more of the human stories and the the people behind the competitors, and that's uh, it's become much more uh, enjoyable. So it sounds like, from what we've said, to like I shouldn't even bother watching the earlier seasons. Like it sounds like it should be starting like season five, season six. Well, you know, seasons. The early seasons are great just to see where the competitors have come from. So there are, like I mentioned, uh, a couple of competitors who've been there the whole time. And that's part of the, the joy of watching the show is over time, people getting stronger, getting better, going further than they have before. You start to, to really gain an affinity for them and the, the effort that they've been putting in, the journey that they're on. So when they, when they do well, you kind of feel like you're succeeding with them. You know, you've been on that journey with them. 
So the old parts of the show, or the old seasons are worth a watch for that reason, just to get to know some of those stories. But, uh, but the real good storytelling started around season four or five. Yeah, season five, I think, is a good, good spot to start. So as far as I'm concerned, in terms of this, this special episode of Everybody Wants to Be in the Batchar, I think American Ninja Warrior definitely fits in to nerd and geek culture for several reasons that we've outlined here. But just to remind people, you know, it started in Japan. It's a spinoff of a show that started in Japan. It has a lot of the like the performance, the talent, the personalities that you would find in superheroes and wrestling. And it has this community that seems to have built up around it, wherein there's now people trying to emulate it outside of the context of the show. Yes. We made it. We made it into the bat jar. You're going to enjoy it. Uh, I have yet to, to, to bring anybody into watching the show and have them say they did not enjoy themselves. We'll see you next time on American Ninja Warrior. Only the best are left. There was one of the best saves we've seen. One of them will walk away with the million dollars. American Ninja Warrior, next Monday on NBC. If you disagree with us, if you don't think that American Ninja Warrior belongs in the bat jar, please send us an email. Let us know how you feel because we have no mail this week. If you want to reach the show, you can send us an email at batjarpodcast at gmail.com message us on facebook or message us on twitter at the bat cookie jar you can find the bat jar podcast in whatever platform you listen to podcasts including youtube please give us a rating write reviews for our shows and share our posts on social media this will help us to bring all people inside the bat jar so now we're going to go in the bat jar to decide what we're going to talk about next week uh, unfortunately for you, Shaggy Neo, normally we would have the guest or the person who isn't me uh, pull the topic out. But since we're not in the same place, um, I have to do it myself. So you're just going to have to trust me that I'm not cheating here, rustling this you're, around. You're a man of great integrity, average Joe. I have no fear that you're rigging this. All right. So we have, it just says best bond, question mark. Ooh. Which I think that means a, show. <laughs> I think it's uh, it's making a reference, of course, to James Bond 007. So I know Beef Pork Ribs is very knowledgeable in this area, so I'm sure he'll appreciate being part of that episode. But sounds Shaggy like ben, the movie buff might need to get in there too. Yeah, <laughs> and of course, if anyone who has been a guest in this show is listening right now, we we're we're in this season of quarantine. We're welcoming everyone back. If you find yourself available when we record, then feel free to join us. And so as we're wrapping up here, we want to, of course, thank Shaggy Neo for being here today. If it weren't for you, really, this episode might not have happened. So you've, you've clearly brought a lot of insight into this, this topic, and you've, you've turned me into a fan of it. So kudos to you for living out of the geeky part of your personality. Geek evangelization for the win. For a you can definitely follow all the ninjas on uh, Instagram. They're particularly active on there. Very inspirational stuff, really fun. Uh, so have a look at any of the names that I mentioned before. Uh, Captain NBC, Jamie Ron is another good one to, to follow on there. It's just a side nerd note. My, I, I never actually described why my name, uh, and I'm not going to give anything away, but Neo has been a nickname that I've had since well 1999 i guess it would be for obvious uh, obvious reasons that's when the matrix came out uh, and then shaggy i wanted to throw that on there as a an homage to the previous uh last week's episode on scooby-doo uh, and also it's a nickname that i've had for probably about 10 years there's some people who still call me that so shaggy neo it is perhaps in future episodes if i have the opportunity to come back i might just be neo uh, unless there's another reason to have the Scooby connection. But uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to change my name on the show once I start. Maybe we'll talk about that later. Who knows? All right. You don't want to mess with your brand, of course. This is true. We, we've already tried one new thing in this show. We can't have people changing their names and everything as well. 
So come back to the Batchar podcast next week when we talk about the best James Bond. And until that time, I'm Average Joe. And I'm Shaggy Neo. Catch you on the flip side. Until next time, keep fit and have fun. <laughs>